Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the County Council. It is Tuesday, December 5th. It's good to see you all. Uh, we have a full day ahead of us here in Rockville, but we are going to get started with two presentations, the first of which is a proclamation recognizing the 125th anniversary of Garrett Park and the 150th anniversary of Washington Grove, two of our cherished communities here, and those are going to be led by the respective district council members, Council Member Stewart and Katz. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kate Stewart. I am the county council member representing District 4, which includes Garrett Park. And we are so glad to be here this morning to celebrate the 125th anniversary of Garrett Park, as well as the 150th anniversary of Washington Grove. As two former mayors, uh, we are glad to be here this morning to lift up our municipalities, because um, we know that our local government, like our county government, and our town and our city governments are the closest to the people. Um, they're the folks who hear from residents um, every time you walk out your door. <laughs> and so we so appreciate the work that you do and the founding of these two um, great towns. Um, you know, Garrett Park, as you'll hear in the uh, proclamation today, is the home to many people who've contributed to our community over the years, as well as a place that really honors and protects our natural environment, our trees, and we're home to our wildlife, um, as well as being a community that is right near transit. And so uh, making sure that we have people near public transportation is also something that uh, has helped uh, our communities and started in places like Garrett Park. And we're gonna welcome down our mayor from Garrett Park and please the Washington Grove folks come down. And as you're coming down, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, um, Councilor Stewart. You know, and, and I know Washington Grove welcomes the newcomers from there. <laughs> it's only you're only 125. <laughs> they're after they're, they're seasoned. They're 150th. But you know, I truly am honored to present both. We're involved in both proclamations. But for Washington Grove, Washington Grove has been a, a great neighbor. Not that I ever lived in Washington Grove. But it's been a great neighbor of Gaithersburg, and I, of course, have lived in Gaithersburg my entire life. <clears throat> and it's certainly District 3, and it's right in the middle of everything. Washington Grove has many distinctions, and um, it's my understanding it's one of the uh, only place in Maryland that has a town meeting form of government that includes a town council of six elected councilors and a mayor, and each councilor is a liaison to two town committees and is responsible for administration of contracts, roads, maintenance, trash and recycling pickup, tree maintenance, and other ongoing upkeep efforts. Most of the work in keeping the town running is performed by volunteers in committees including the Woods Group, the Recreation Committee, the Lake Committee, the Historic Preservation Committee, and many others. Washington Grove has maintained its historic character and community values in modern times. The town has one of the most intact collections of original carpenter Gothic cottages in the entire country, in the entire country, and has more land devoted to forest and parks than it does to development. Moreover, the Washington Grove Historic District is listed on the National Registry for Historic Places. And we certainly congratulate Washington Grove on its milestone anniversary. I'd like to invite my classmate, now she's a year younger and she certainly wants to mention that, but my classmate Meredith Rand to say a few words, please. Well, welcome everyone. It's such an honor to be here today. And Washington Grove, where I've been since 1959, means so much. Uh, thank you, John Compton, for your leadership over the years. Sydney, we. I've known you many years. I'd like to give the counselors and anyone else today who would like one a copy of our souvenir from our 150th, which will close December 31st, unfortunately. But um, I'll leave them here. You can pick them up or I'll pass them out. So thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Yeah, and 
And we have the Mayor Garrett Park who would like to say a few words. Thank you. Beautiful. That's pretty. Members of the County Council, thank you so much for this recognition of the town of Garrett Park's 125th anniversary. You know, my, my favorite part of this so cool. is getting to use the word quasipocentennial, because it means 125th, but I never have any occasion, so quasipocentennial. Uh, as an 18-year resident of Garrett Park, it's easy for me to rattle off the many things that make my town special. We've never had home delivery of mail. We declared our jurisdiction to be nuclear-free earlier than such forward-thinking municipalities as Tacoma Park, Berkeley, California, and Boulder, Colorado. And in the mid-1950s, decades before Major League Baseball even thought of bringing a team to D.C., we cheered for the Little League Garrett Park Nats, but that was spelled G-N-A-T-S. As we look ahead to our 150th anniversary, we remain focused on preserving the fun, whimsy, and quirkiness that, is, that exemplify the town of Garrett Park, but we also aim to partner with you all on issues of sustainability, walkability, and recreational opportunities for residents of all ages. So thank you for this honor today, and we look forward to many more opportunities to work with the, the county uh, to make Garrett Park and our neighbors all what they can be. Thank you so much, Joanna, and I will read the proclamation for Garrett Park and then turn it over to Councilmember Katz for the one on Washington Grove. Okay. The County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland proclamation. Whereas in April 1898, the Maryland legislature incorporated the town of Garrett Park, giving it full authority to hold its own elections, craft and pass ordinances, and oversee its own operations. And whereas on May 2nd, 1898, the town of Garrett Park held its first election, marking the beginning of the sovereignty of this town. And whereas Garrett Park is home to many notable activists, scholars, and artists of the 20th century, including Jesse Ross Thompson, a suffragette and creator of the still active Women's Club, Charles Mosman, Vice Admiral in the U.S. Navy and inventor of the two life-saving tools used to rescue survivors of the USS Squalus submarine accident in 1939, and Donald McLaughlin, architect and graphic designer who designed the emblem for the 1945 United Nations Conference on International Organization, which served as the prototype for the current UN emblem. And whereas the residents of Garrett Park have a demonstrated history of engaging in the democratic process, using their municipal authority to vote on a referendum which designated the town a nuclear-free zone in 1982, one of the first such zones in the United States, or the first zone in the United States, uh, whereas the Garrett Park Citizens Association continuously supports town residents by providing forums for public discussions and organizing town-wide events, and whereas the town has sustained significant growth, increasing uh, from a population of just 17 people in 30 buildings in 1900, to now supporting about 1,000 residents and over 300 homes. And whereas today, Garrett Park is home to an eclectic mix of architects, art artists, writers, lawyers, business owners, healthcare professionals, and government officials who continuously engage in their town council and community groups to make their town a beautiful and welcoming place to live. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes the year of 2023 as Garrett Park's 125th anniversary in Montgomery County, um, signed this day by Council Member Katz, myself, and Council President Glass, and the whole council. Thank you. And I, too, have a proclamation, whereas in 1937, Washington Grove's first mayor, Roy McCaffrey, and he still obviously has family members that still live there, described it as a town within a forest, an oasis of tranquility, and a rustic jewel, and a diadem, uh, the diadem of the great free state of Maryland. And whereas after the Civil War ended, Washington Grove became a desirable destination due to the conflux of building of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and the increasing popularity of camp meetings, where a significant number of Methodists within the Washington, D.C. area were looking for a place in the country to hold religious retreats. And whereas in July 1873, the land of Washington Grove was conveyed to the Camp Meeting Association in March 1937, the Maryland legislature incorporated it as a municipality, as the town evolved into a year-round community within its own governance, and whereas this wonderful, dynamic community offers 
a, a plethora of activities and programs throughout the year, including its 4th of July parade, uh, Baroque breakfast at the gazebo, concerts at the McGath McCatherine Hall, and much more. And whereas while, the Washington, while Washington Grove has grown over the years as a Montgomery County suburb with convenient access to transportation and transit, it still keeps the feel of a small, tight-knit community and, as described by Mayor McCatherine in 1937, an oasis of tranquility for its residents. Now there, therefore be resolved uh, that today is Washington Grove's, uh, the, the, the uh, County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby celebrates Washington Grove's 150th anniversary. It's signed by Council Member Stewart, myself, and Council President Evan Glass. Congratulations. our uh, most in-demand places to live in Montgomery County. They are hidden treasures, but they are hidden no more. Uh, next is a proclamation recognizing Rosa Parks Day that will be led by myself and the county executive, and I welcome everybody else who's here for that to come on down. Good morning, everybody. It was 68 years ago this week when one courageous woman stood up for, or you could say sat down for the rights of millions of Americans. The, the legacy of Rosa Parks is one that we hold firm today. It's one in which we fight for private access and public access to goods, to services, and to government. And the reason that is so incredibly important, the fight for racial justice, for equity, and for fairness, is because we know what started off as a sit-in on a public bus has turned into so much more. And when we talk about transit and transit equity, and the fight for everybody to be able to travel throughout our community. Here in Montgomery County, we know that racial equity and social justice is an incredible part of, an important part of our ride on bus system. The average bus rider earns about $35,000 in their home, while the average Montgomery County household earns an average of about $110,000. That is the divide in our community. That's the divide on our roads. And that is why we continue holding the legacy of Rosa Parks in our hearts, in our buses, uh, and in our policies. 
And so from Montgomery, Alabama to Montgomery County, Maryland, we celebrate Rosa Parks Day. And now I'll introduce County Executive Elrich. So I'm glad to be here today and to talk about this a little bit. Uh, you know, Rosa Parks was a pioneer, but it wasn't the only thing going on at the time. And the civil rights movement had begun to, again, resurface and to challenge the establishment and the status quo at that time. And it was important that people like her took the final step of being willing to sit down and not put up with it anymore, or stand up and not put up with it anymore. For those of you who are old enough to remember the 50s or before that, this country was deeply immersed in racism. There wasn't a social institution in this country. You can't think of the churches and say these churches lined up behind civil rights, because by and large, they did not. And by and large, no political party supported the civil rights movement in the 1950s. This was the reality of this country. University of Maryland, in Maryland, openly discriminated against black students well into the 1960s when I was a student there. So this is not a moment in time. It's a celebration of this particular act at a time that began to catalyze people's imaginations and make them realize we could not go on the way we were going on. And I will say I believe the willingness of people to stand up to be difficult and to do what John Lewis said, cause good trouble, is the thing that ultimately changed this. People who suffer in silence very rarely get change. People who fight back and push back start to articulate what their dreams are and what they want are the people who actually get to make the change. And Rosa Parks is a real pioneer for that. You can only imagine what courage it took to not get up when you were told to get up on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and what she was willing to endure to make the point that she wanted to stay there. So this is why we celebrate her. That's why you're going to see these things on ride-on buses. We want the message out there in the community. We remember, we know, and it's important that community residents remember and know what happened. Uh, you cannot appreciate where we've gone if you don't understand where we were. And you can't understand that there's more to do if you think we solved everything, because we've clearly not solved everything. So this struggle continues, and she was one of the great pioneers in this, and so that's why we're doing this today. It was four days and 68 years ago when she sat down. And I'll turn it over to, who's next here? Mr. Stowe. Good morning, uh, members of council, uh, President Glass. Thank you so much for your endorsement. And of course, County Executive, thank you so much for your support. And to our Department of Transportation, Chris Crumpton, thank you and your team uh, for always uh, stepping up to this very important day. Uh, I want you just to start off by saying that uh, Professor Fort said uh, I attended the um, uh, North Carolina State University, and they said that words don't mean, but people do. Um, but today, I'm going to talk about what words did mean. Those four words when asked by the very angry bus driver to Rosa Parks, uh, will you, in fact, get up from that seat? And her words were, no, I will not, sir. Uh, and that changed, as county executive said, uh, what we think about civil rights forever. Uh, but you need to understand why she said that, because we often think about her not willing to get up out of her seat as some sort of defiance at that point in time, and indeed it was. But folks, she was sitting in her appropriate seat. On the buses, there was a placard that said colored in the back of the bus. But those of us who know what that meant in the days of the South, that meant then that beyond that placard, you could sit if you were, quote, colored. And those, again, in front of that, in front of the buses where white people sat. Now, the rule was this, that if all the seats were filled in the bus, then those who were sitting in their appropriate seat by law had to get out, up out of their seat and get off the bus. Oftentimes, then being late for work and late for other obligations that they, in fact, had been there early enough to be on the bus in the first place, they had, in fact, endured the indignities of getting off the bus. So Rosa Parks was in her right seat. She was in her lawful seat. And so when she got up, out, in this case, when they came back and asked her to get up out of her seat, the thing was this, again, the, this ongoing indignity, not just a bus ride, folks. 
It was in every aspect of life. And so in that particular situation, circumstance, her defiant move that day set in motion the fact that people could endure sacrifices for a cause. And 381 days later, the declaration that in fact, that act of segregation was illegal, not only in the state of Alabama, but all across this country. So it can happen. The actions of one person can in fact lead an entire movement. And her final words were simply this, never be afraid to do what is right. Never be afraid to do what is right. And I may add, under this, under this whole experience of laws, we should never be afraid to do what is right. So we honor today this uh, movement that has gone forward. And again, our thanks to all of you and be supportive of this. And think about this on this day and every day going forward that we in fact can make a difference in Montgomery County by single acts of kindness and need be defiance. Good morning, everybody. I'm Chris Conklin, director of the Montgomery County Department of Transportation. Uh, and I've been thinking for a few days about what to say at this event today because speaking at these sorts of things is not nat natural to me generally, but I was traveling to another part of the country this weekend, and it was a part of the country that's not dissimilar from Montgomery County, Maryland. It's next to a major metropolitan area. The economics are similar. The land use is similar. But what resonated with me was the expression of that community's values in the services they provide was radically different. I was thinking as I was traveling around that portion of the country that if you didn't have the means to own your own car, it would be impossible to live your life in that community. It would be impossible to achieve things that were beyond what you could do from your home or within five minutes of your home by walking or biking. This community is radically different than that. When I look at the ride on buses and the services they provide throughout the county, the access they provide, the level of service that's provided, it is remarkable. And it's an expression of Montgomery County's values in the people that live here and our efforts to change people's ability to achieve for themselves. And I'm so proud to work for a community that expresses its values through the services it's provided and through action. So uh, I'm, I'm really happy that we can commemorate this day, both in the service we deliver every day and through recognizing Rosa Parks and her actions to open up public transit to serve everybody equally and to provide that access to opportunity that it does so well. So thank you for inviting me to be here today. Good morning. Um, can people hear me through this? All right, thank you. I'm always so short, I have to like filter right down. Um, hi, my name is Carrie Kosicki, and I'm the Montgomery County Advocacy Manager for the Coalition for Smarter Growth. Um, and we believe that great public transportation access is absolutely key to achieving racial and eco economic equity. Um, and it's an honor to be here today to recognize Rosa Parks and the more than 40,000 people who participated in the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott. The courage and determination that boycott participants displayed for more than a full year as they faced violence, intimidation, and daily inconvenience reminds us that merely providing access to public transit is not enough. It is vital that every rider who steps onto public transportation is treated with the dignity that they deserve. Providing equitable and dignified public transit means that having the resources to afford a car is not a condition of full participation in our communities. It means ensuring that marginalized communities have great access to public transit with stops that people of all ages and abilities can reach conveniently and safely. It means that the bus runs to the places people need it at the times of the day that they need it and frequently enough that one missed bus doesn't mean you have to worry about losing your job. And above all, it means that when you ride public transit, you feel that you are a person who matters and that your needs are being served as a full and equal member of your community. I'm glad that in Montgomery County, we recognize the essential role that high quality, fully funded public transit plays in achieving racial and economic equity. Every time that we make an investment in public transportation, we promote the full and equal participation of all residents in our county, and we honor the memory of Rosa Parks. Thank you. Hello. There we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lev Boonin. I am the organizer for the Action Committee for Transit. Uh, 
when anyone can get where they want to go safely, efficiently, and comfortably, by any mode, everyone benefits. Transit is at its best when it serves all members of the community, regardless of race, creed, wealth, gender, sex, or rank, with the same level of convenience, comfort, and respect. We are all trying to get somewhere. So let's get there together. Today as we honor the legacy of the O'us who came before us to move us towards the future or promise of a more perfect union and a more equal world. We also look towards the future of young activists that's coming up now who will push us further towards it in the days and years to come. Thank you. Thank you everybody for your words and uh, thank you Director Conklin for sharing your perspectives on how other counties and other communities do it and how we do it better and do it with uh, equity in our hearts and in our policy. So now County Executive and I will uh, read this proclamation. Uh, proclamation from Montgomery County, Maryland. Whereas Rosa Louise McCauley Parks is an American hero, her courage and moral clarity in the face of bigotry and oppression launched the civil rights movement and inspired millions to stand up for fundamental fairness. And? Whereas Rosa Parks' refusal to give up her seat to a white man on a Montgomery, Alabama bus on Thursday, December 1st, 1955, where her voice of determined dignity uttering the four words, I will not, sir, gave voice to thousands in their fight against injustice and intolerance, and whereas? Whereas Ms. Parks' arrest sparked the December 5th boycott of city buses by 42,000 African Americans that brought the city of Montgomery to a standstill, ignited the civil rights movement, and changed the course of America for millions of disenfranchised people, and? Whereas this act of civil disobedience was, caused, was called the Montgomery Bus Boycott, which lasted 381 days, ending on December 21st, 1956, following the U.S. Supreme Court ruling on November 13th, 1956, that segregation on public city buses was unconstitutional and... Whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had helped organize the Montgomery Improvement Association, and was elected to lead the mass movement of the bus boycott propelling the nonviolent resistance into what would be called the civil rights movement. And? Whereas Rosa Parks' defiance and heroism that day showed that one person can change the course of history and inspire change in the hearts of a nation. She'll be remembered as the mother of the civil rights movement. In her own words, you must never be fearful about what people, about what you are doing when it is right. Now, therefore, be resolved, Mark Elrich is County Executive and Evan Glass is Council President of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby proclaim the month of December um, 2023 as Rosa Parks Public Transportation Month in Montgomery County. We urge all our residents to remember Ms. Parks' unyielding commitment to a better world and her unconquerable will to battle injustice of, at tremendous risk to herself for the sake of the greater good. We must continue the movement toward a more fair and just society for all. As a tribute and symbolic show of solidarity with the memory of Rosa Parks, the civil rights movement, and the commitment to equal access for all in public transportation, the Montgomery County Department of Transportation and the Ride On Transit System will display a placard on every bus throughout the month of December commemorating this important historic event, signed the fifth day of December in the year 2023 by myself and Evan Glass.
Thank you, everybody, for that very meaningful proclamation and affirmation of our work here in Montgomery County. Uh, we're now going to move on to general business. Madam Clerk, are there any announcements? Good morning, Mr. President, Council Members. We have several announcements today. There were several changes to today's agenda. The legislative session originally scheduled for this afternoon has been moved to the morning. The election of officers has been moved to the afternoon, and we've added a closed session this afternoon. Additionally, the Montgomery County Council is seeking applicants to fill 11 public member vacancies on the Advisory Commission on Policing. The ACP is responsible for advising the Council on policing matters, recommending legislation or regulation for the Council's consideration conducting public outreach for community input and accepting community feedback. Applications for the year three-year appointments are due by 5 p.m. on December 8th. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, Council Member Katz has a comment. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I appreciate the announcement about the uh, Advisory Commission on Policing, but I think that giving only three days notice, though we have given more notice than that prior, but to announce it and only get three days' notice, I, I don't believe is, is the uh, proper way. I, I would suggest that we do at least one additional week, and I know that there's a time frame that we need to be working under, and if it could be longer than that, that would be fine with me as well, but I think we should have at least one additional week. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Katz. Uh, I absolutely agree with your recommendation that three days is not enough. Uh, and. Uh, if colleagues agree, uh, we'll extend that to the 15th of December without objection. Uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Katz. So, uh, just to clarify the, uh, or Madam Clerk, do you want to make a clarifying announcement? Yes, thank you, Mr. President. A applications for the three year appointments are due by 5 p.m. on December 15th. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. The minutes from the November 7th and November 14th uh, council meetings have been circulated to colleagues for approval. Uh, if there are no objections, then we'll adopt those minutes. And those minutes are adopted. The first item official item on the agenda this morning is a presentation from the Montgomery County Anti-Hate Task Force. And I want to start off by thanking all of my colleagues for uh, approving a resolution about five months ago to create this important body. We know that in 2021, the latest report that we've received from the Montgomery County Police Department's anti-hate uh, hate and bias incidents report, and we know that 2021 had seen a record level of hate in our community. At that point in time, it was a 10-year high, and we know that it has not gotten better. Uh, local issues, national issues, international issues have exacerbated tensions, anxieties, and fears among people all around the world and also people in our community, which is why bringing together 30 members of our community to talk about how we as a community need to come together has been an incredibly important process. I want to thank the 30 members of the task force, many of whom are here this morning. We are going to hear from the six cohorts, the leaders or appointed chairs or co-chairs of those six different groups, the six most affected groups of residents according to Montgomery County Police Department. We know those groups are members of the Muslim community, the Jewish community, the Latino Hispanic community, the Black and African American community, the Asian American Pacific Islander community, and LGBTQ plus community. Uh, in addition to the 30 members of our community who served on this task force, I also want to thank a number of uh, ex officio members, including the county executive, state's attorney John McCarthy, human rights director Jim Stowe, Montgomery County Police Department Chief Marcus Jones, representatives from Montgomery County Public Schools, Damon Montaliano, and also a representative from Montgomery College, 
Michelle Campbell. Um, and I also want to give and extend my deep, deep appreciation to two members of the Montgomery County Council staff who really shepherded this effort. There were more than 50 meetings over the last four months, all of which are available publicly online for members of the community who want to learn more about this work, who want to hear in real time the concerns, the thoughts, and the proposals residents have shared. All of that is on the Council's website, and all of this was done with the leadership of Selena Singleton and Bertha Sarisomos. Thank you both for your incredible work and leadership and dedication to our community and dedication to making sure that our residents are safe and welcome for being their true and authentic selves. Uh, and so uh, for colleagues and for the public, what we're going to be doing for the next hour or two, uh, I'd like to invite up every member, uh, every leader, appointed leader within the six cohorts uh, to come to the table. Uh, each will have a five-minute presentation, and we're trying to limit it to five minutes so that we can have a conversation. Uh, and then after all of the six presentations, uh, colleagues will have an opportunity to weigh in, and, and we'll try and keep that to a, a minimal time as well. Uh, and then we can have a second round of conversation if people want. But there will be no PowerPoint presentations during these brief five-minute discussions, but everything is available in our staff packet. So if you're following this conversation, you can go to the Council website, go to today's agenda, uh, and you will see the full report out and PowerPoint presentations and recommendations from each of the cohorts. So now I'd like to invite up Ms. Ariane Yang, Mr. Ron White, Ms. Meredith Weisel, Mr. Alex Vasquez, Mr. Philip Alexander Downey, and Ms. Amberine Khan. And when we had our last meeting, a uh, full meeting of the task force one week ago, uh, we went in alphabetical order, and then today we'll go in reverse alphabetical order um, for fairness. So we'll start with Ms. Ms. Khan. Thank you, Council. Uh, uh, if you turn your microphone on, Amber. Amber Ann. There you go. <laughs> there you go. In the interest of being heard, let's turn the microphone on. Thank you, Council President Glass and Council members. For your attention to this issue in our county and for making efforts to prioritize actionable steps that can be taken to counter hate. I'm Umbreen Khan and I'm presenting recommendations on behalf of our five member Muslim cohort that includes Dr. Ilhan Kagri, Adila Sharif, for those Qadir and Imam Fazl Khan. Our original recommendation presented on October 10th in your packet includes 17 specific actions for strengthening existing infrastructure to address implicit and explicit bias, many of which are reflected in the recommendations from other cohorts. Since that time, however, the situation for Muslims and those perceived to be Muslim has changed. We are facing an avalanche of harassment in the workplace and in the schools verbal assault and intimidation in public places, bullying, doxing, and even violent attacks. There is a crisis of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim bigotry. Once again, our community is enduring a backlash triggered by transnational events. For many, it's because they express concern for Palestinians and protesting the indiscriminate killing of civilians by the tens of thousands aided by U.S. tax dollars. When we bring these hate incidents up with county officials, we're told that we must report, but we're stymied. We found that because many of the incidents do not rise to the level of a crime, victims face skepticism and challenges in filing reports. Even when they are violent or threats of violence are documented. 
Community organizations like CARE and ADC have seen reports of hate and bias incidents skyrocket. Whereas our county police records show no record of anti-Muslim hate incidents. Muslim and other marginalized residents need an easy and centralized place to report. To this end, we are asking this body to immediately create an office of an ombudsman on hate. We are asking for a staffed office that can hold hearings and produce a public report on the state of hate, which will serve as an auditing mechanism to improve the functions, assist you in holding leaders to account, and ultimately to demonstrate accountability to the residents and restore confidence. Which leads to our second ask. We need a countywide summit that will affirm the importance of protecting nonviolent political speech and educating private sector employers, school leaders, civic organizations, social service groups, and NGOs on the ways in which protected speech is currently being quashed. This summit should address three areas, the types and extent of harassment and discrimination Muslims and those perceived to be Muslim, especially students, are facing. Issuing a public statement that is unequivocal in rejecting Islamophobia and anti-Muslim, anti-Arab bigotry. And third, a summit that clarifies and affirms the First Amendment rights and guarantees of protected political speech and expression, including Title VI protection against national origin discrimination. The Muslim community is reflected by nearly every other cohort here at this table. We are African and Black Americans, Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, Latinx, as well as LGBTQ. Too often, Islamophobic tropes and anti-Muslim bias erase the diversity of our cohort. On November 5th, counter demonstrators who tried to disrupt a peaceful interfaith rally in Rockville not only threatened to rape, maim, and kill while waving the Israeli flag, they were hurling racial slurs and anti-gay epithets. The video of the egregious verbal assault was disturbing to many people present, and it was recorded. Council Member Friedson, we were heartened to hear you on the Kojo Namdi show denounce the Islamophobia. We invite you to listen to our presentation on November 28th where I describe how our task force member encountered multiple challenges in getting a police report filed on that incident. It was only by using her contacts in county government did she finally succeed. It took two weeks to hear any county response to that hate incident in Rockville. And we to date have no response from law enforcement. This illustrates the challenges and is one reason why there is a widespread perception by our community that anti-Muslim bias and bigotry enjoys impunity. The county resolution adopting the IRA definition on anti-Semitism has played a role in weaponizing anti-Semitism to quash criticisms of the policies of the State of Israel. This threatens free speech and nonviolent civil disobedience. It is the constitutionally protected right of Marylanders to engage in peaceful protests, including students in our schools. One of the authors of the IRA resolution, former AJC staff member, Dr. Kenneth Stern, has written extensively on the misuse of the IRA definition of anti-Semitism by government entities. In fact, he spoke two weeks ago about the crackdown on political speech that refers to Palestine and Israel on school campuses. The overly broad and politicized definition is being used now to target not only Muslims, Arabs, and Middle Easterners, but also Jewish voices. In hopes of returning to our highest ideals and restoring confidence of the Muslim Arab cohort and those perceived to be members of this cohort, we urge you to raise your voices in advocating for protection for everyone's right to opinion and to dissent against injustice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Khan, and thank you to members of the cohort as well who are here today. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Downey. Awesome. 
Hi, my name is Philip Alexander Downey, and I am one of the co-chairs for the LGBTQ uh, plus cohort, um, along with my colleagues, Reverend Ali Casey Bell, who uses he uh, and they pronouns, and Reverend Al and Rabbi Adam Rosenwasser, who uses he, him pronouns, and my pronouns are he, him as well. So the Montgomery County LGBTQIA plus community has a diverse makeup like that of um, the United States and that of the entire world. LGBTQIA plus people have existed from the beginning of time and in every society, um, in every facet, in every culture, in every religion. Um, we are your colleagues, we are your siblings, we are your friends, we are your doctors, we are your unhoused populations. We, are ev we exist in every single facet um, that makes up our uh, great and diverse county as well as our country. Um, when we uh, really looked into what policy recommendations um, to present to you all today, um, we utilized the Montgomery County LGBTQ uh, plus 2023 Community Survey Report. The CDC's LGBTQ youth, uh, LGBTQ plus youth um, addressing health disparities with a school-based approach um, MCPS's Office of School Support and Wellbeing, um, and the Montgomery County Police Department's annual report on biases. Um, our policy recommendations, um, as a community, we are at a pivotal time, um, and our policy recommendations um, are reflective of the urgent need that takes place now and has been taking place. Um, it requires decisive action to combat hate crimes and biases while promoting wellness. The policy recommendations presented here form a high-level roadmap towards creating a safer and more inclusive Montgomery County for all of its residents, irrespective of their gender identities, their sexual orientation, or their cultural backgrounds. These recommendations address critical areas such as cultural competency, education, community meeting places and centers, and reporting mechanisms. By implementing these policies, we aim not only to counteract the persisting challenges, but to build a community where diversity is celebrated and all individuals thrive. The urgency lies in fostering a culture of acceptance and understanding and support to create lasting and positive change. So our first policy recommendations start with the county government um, in ensuring that we allocate resources for a physical center uh, that provides a uh, comprehensive set of wellness resources that are needed by our most vulnerable, um, underserved, and marginalized populations. We know from uh, health reporting data from the CDC, uh, from Montgomery County, Maryland, um, as well as community reports, um, that LGBTQ people uh, face disparities um, more significant when you compile them with every other identity that they have. Um, that piece we call intersectionality. So when you are LGBTQ and black, when you are LGBTQ plus and Muslim, when you are LGBTQ plus and Jewish, when you are LGBTQ plus and a first generation American, we are facing higher rates of uh, suicide in our youth. We are facing disproportional rates of homelessness. We are facing disproportional rates of housing and food insecurity. And so we need to take action to ensure that there are resources that are available so that we can combat several different areas and facets that all exist that when you were trying to seek um, when you were trying to seek vital uh, important community wellness resources that you were not met with hate and discrimination um, we recommend a funding a resource center for LGBTQIA plus individuals that is community-based, um, that really addresses the complex needs that can provide linkages to care um, to ensure wellness within our populations. We are looking to ensure that we allocate community funding to expand satellite LGBTQIA 
LGBTQIA plus programming to reach our diverse communities within the vast communities of Montgomery County. We know that one space, a central location, does provide a meeting hub as well as safe spaces where people can express themselves authentically. But we also know that Montgomery County is extremely vast and diverse, and the needs of our southern Montgomery County population <coughs> residents aren't always the needs of our other residents, and I will speed up. We will need to ensure accessibility um, to all of our uh, county government resources um, that serve all of our different communities, um, and we need to strengthen our liaison positions within Montgomery County that are not full-time that reach our community residents. Um, in addition, we are seeking countywide training um, to implement countywide community-based cultural competency training for all of our residential services. Um, we want to ensure that all service providers are culturally competent and create an inclusive environment for gender and sexuality minorities as well as racial and cultural minorities with intersectionality as a focus. We want to expand MCPS professional days by 30%, provide culturally competent and community-derived professional development for school staff to ensure they have the tools and necessary resources to create environments of inclusivity. And we want to ensure that in our Montgomery County Police Departments that there are ERGs or officer resource groups where police can feel safe being their authentic selves so they can, pre they can bridge the gaps within community reporting. And we want to ensure that there is comprehensive tracking on all reports within the police department so that statements um, that are anti-LGBTQ and anti, uh, that are hateful and have a bias are uh, tracked and reported with a comprehensive nature. So together, let's us build a future where every individual is not just accepted, but celebrated, ensuring Montgomery County shines as a beacon of inclusion, empowerment, and progress. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Downey, and thank you to members of, of the LGBTQ plus cohort as well. Uh, now we'll hear from Mr. Vasquez. Awesome. Good morning, buenos dias. My name is Alex Vasquez. I am the co-chair of the Latino Hispanic cohort. Like many of my cohort members, I'm here today in multiple capacities, but most importantly, I'm here as a Mexican immigrant and resident of the county. Our cohort is extremely grateful for the unwavering dedication and diligence of all the cohorts involved in this critical initiative. Our collective efforts and insightful presentations exemplify the commitment to eradicating hate and promoting community where our shared values transcend the forces that seek to divide us. As we navigate through these challenging times, it is crucial to underscore our shared purpose. Our mission extends <clears throat> beyond identifying and preventing hate-driven incidents, but it also includes finding common ground that unites us. And before I go into our uh, policy recommendations, uh, I want to also uplift the members of the cohort, uh, Daniel Centeno uh, from Impact Silver Spring, uh, Ruben Pañeda, a community member and a lifetime advocate, Nora Ilia Morales from Identity, Vanessa Pinto from Cheer, and myself from CASA, and collectively our organizations service thousands of members, particularly in our Latino and Hispanic community here in Montgomery County. With you uh, for you today, we have seven policy recommendations that our cohort has put together, uh, gathered from uh, data and surveys that we have conducted these last few months. Uh, and we also uh, want to give a special thanks um, to Councilwoman uh, Natalie Fani Gonzalez and Gabe Albernas, who also participated uh, in a roundtable discussion with prominent uh, Latinx leaders a few weeks ago. <clears throat> so let's dive right in. Policy recommendation number one. We want to task the Office of Community Engagement to conduct regional Spanish listening sessions in the predominantly Latinx census tract of the county with adults and youth ages 11 to 18 to collect their experiences with agency regarding hate, bias, and prejudice in the county to pinpoint areas of concern and develop an action plan to address concerns. There is, since there is little quantitative and qualitative data on hate slash bias incidents or crimes in Montgomery County, we must conduct a needs assessment 
to learn more about the Latinx experience in Montgomery County. And from these regional listening sessions, we can develop a baseline to determine what the Latinx community is experiencing and prioritize areas of need and develop action plans to address concerns. Policy recommendation number two, launch a campaign and training for the community on how to report hate crimes towards Latinx, where to obtain help, and what to do when concerns are not addressed in a timely manner. The Latinx community has been the target of hate and bias incidents and hate crimes for so long that it is seen as part of the Latinx, Latinx experience and therefore remains heavily underreported. In addition, many Latinx community members fear the consequences of reporting hate and bias incidents and crimes. That is why the countywide training and awareness have to occur in order to address the implicit and explicit hate and bias that Latinx community members experience. Policy recommendation number three, provide cultural competency training to all county agencies on the Latinx community, how to conduct outreach within our community, and how to provide effective and excellent customer service to Latinx community members. As we have shared, uh, the Latinx community is complex and layered and has its own unique challenges to access equity and opportunities within the county. County-based solutions must be made with the Latinx community, not for them. And they cannot be a size-fits-all mentality. <clears throat> or we will perpetrate the historical inequities that our community has faced nationally and also within Montgomery County. Recommendation number four, task the appropriate county office to form a diversity hiring work group to increase the number of Latinx representatives in managerial and executive roles within the government agencies because representation matters. If our children are to be the future of Latinx leaders, we must provide them with role models that they can identify with and aspire to be. And living up to the ideals of Montgomery County as one of the most diverse counties in the country requires that our boardrooms, executive offices, and the county council reflect the diversity of our county. Again, representation matters. Policy recommendation number five, increase funding and capacity for interpretation and translation in key agencies such as courts, MC311, DHHS, police, fire, and more. Nearly 40% of Montgomery County Latinx are in need of interpretation and translation services. Closing the opportunity and access gap for Latinx community members means providing robust language access services in key county agencies still. And this is uh, ensuring that these services are being advertised appropriately is importantly. Almost done. Policy recommendation number six, create a Montgomery County Office of Immigrant Affairs to help coordinate information, resources, training, and services for the new and long-term immigrant residents of the county. Like DC, New York, and other jurisdictions have created offices of immigrant affairs to streamline services and avoid duplication. Montgomery County could learn from these best practices to create an infrastructure that can help our immigrant and refugee communities better access services and resources and integrate into the diverse fabric of Montgomery County. And last but not least, recommendation number seven, create a community grant or continue creating a community grant initiative to distribute funding to grassroots organizations to engage in authentic community outreach and education to prevent hate and bias incidents and crimes towards the Latinx community. Right now, we are living in a precarious time in history when hatred and vitriol are at an all-time high. Many of our colleagues who presented before us and will present before us have stated as much. And we believe in the power of our Montgomery County community, faith-based organizations to help educate, heal, and create safe spaces for civil discourse, cross-cultural learning, and understanding. However, most organizations require funding to do this well and reach as many of our residents as we can. We ask the county government to facilitate this investment in our peace and healing by continuing to provide resources to organizations to do this work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vasquez, and thank you to members of your cohort for those very thoughtful recommendations. Next, we'll turn to Ms. Weisel. Thank you, Council President Glass and members of the County Council. I'm Meredith Weisel, here as the chair of the Jewish cohort. Also members of the Jewish co cohort are Alan Ronkin, Ron Halber, Alex Stone, and Rabbi Sue Shankman. 
So the past several years, we have seen a tremendous rise in anti-Semitic incidents and, frankly, other forms of hate, as you're hearing from other cohorts. 2022 was the highest year on record of anti-Semitic incidents reported. We have to understand that when we say incidents also, and when a lot of us are talking up here, that doesn't mean that everything rises to the level of a hate crime under the legal definition of whether it's the federal or state hate crime statute. However, that doesn't mean the impact of a biased incident should be diminished. And that's a really important thing for us to remember here as we're all talking. It's also important to understand what is anti-Semitism the marginalization and oppression of people who are Jewish based on the belief in stereotypes, myths, and disinformation about Jewish people, Judaism as a whole, and yes, the state of Israel. Parallel to all systems of oppression, anti-Semitism can manifest as the dehumanization or exploitation of or the discrimination of violence of Jewish people. Anti-Semitism can sometimes target Jews as individuals, or as a collective, whether that's Jewish organizations, movements like Zionism, which is the right of Jewish people to self-determination and the historical ties to the land of Israel, or to the Jewish state of Israel. Since October 7th, since our report, we put a report out in August, but since October 7th, we have seen a drastic increase in anti-Semitic incidents across the globe, and Montgomery County has not been immune to this. 2023 was already trending to be the highest on record, surpassing 2022. The amount of incidents that we have seen since October 7th puts us way over. We have seen swastikas drawn on desks, a We Stand with Israel banner at a synagogue vandalized, a Jewish home have their mezuzah torn off and Nazi graffiti put on that individual's car, anti-Semitic vandalism in various parks, Jewish day schools are being targeted with anti-Semitic statements and threats, Jewish students have been harassed, targeted, and singled out to the point that many are afraid to go to school. I want to be really clear here at the beginning before my recommendations. Criticism of Israel is absolutely appropriate. Criticism of the Israeli government is absolutely appropriate. There is a wide range of views regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and vigorous debate and activism on this complex situation is an important component of public discourse and the free exchange of ideas. Israel is a country like any other country with policies that range from laudable to condemnable. And we don't have to agree with every policy. But at the same time, there are certain forms of criticism that cross into anti-Semitism. When you use anti-Jewish tropes, hold all Jews responsible for Israel's action, or utilize traditional anti-Semitic imagery or comparisons to Nazis. And that is some of the incidents that we have been seeing the past few months, two months. With that, our recommendations still stand from earlier this year. And some of the items specific in our PowerPoint, but I want to just talk about the top recommendations, which actually are very similar to the previous cohorts and what you're going to hear after. The county executive and county council recommendations. We recommend trainings for all county employees. We must be holding anti-bias workshops and specific trainings for county employees to understand anti-Semitism and understand what is Judaism. Including anti-Semitism and other forms of religious bigotry and anti-discrimination policies. We also should look at local legislation to combat hateful propaganda and flyers that are plaguing our communities. It is a endemic that is impacting all of us. We should, which the council actually did already this year, recognize Jewish American Heritage Month that we can ask for that to be continued. Create a strategic and comprehensive community organizational partnership that will meet Plus, continue the work of this anti-hate task force. This should not be the end today. We should be looking at holding a monthly meeting against hate, getting the cohorts together regularly, some sort of summit. 
enhancing security funding for all religious and nonprofit organizations that are at risk of hate crimes, which the council has certainly looked into and the county executive, but this needs to continue. It cannot be a one-off. For law enforcement, we strongly recommend trainings on hate crimes and extremism for all law enforcement officers and staff. It is not just the officer reporting, but staff answering the phone, because as you've heard from previous cohorts, they are not always taking these incidents seriously. A creating a hate crime special liaison branch within MCPD and a very specific hotline on hate and bias. And for MCPS, the top level recommendations legislate education about the Holocaust and other forms of genocide, and also train MCPS faculty, not just the teachers in the classroom, but all faculty on the history of anti-Semitism, which predates the Holocaust and also is now after the Holocaust and all forms of hate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weisel, for those recommendations. And thank you to members of, of the Jewish co cohort as well. Um, now I'll turn to Mr. Wright. Good morning, Council Chair Glass uh, <clears throat> and esteemed Council. I'm Ron Wright with uh, the African American cohort. I am one of the chairs. Uh, with us today is uh, Director Jim Stowe, who is also a cohort member, and Attorney Lisa Taylor, uh, also a cohort member. Uh, we also were served with uh, four additional members, uh, Mr. Joseph Hooks, Jackie Denard, uh, Tiffany Taylor, Tiffany Kelly, I'm sorry, uh, and Reverend James Boney. Uh, based on the available information from stakeholders, MCBS, listening sessions, community surveys, and numerous virtual public meetings, we presented a six of 24 recommendations for combating hate, bias, and hate incidents that's occurring against black people in this county. They address our criminal justice, MCPS, and faith and community counterparts who, though while not perfect, are working diligently with all communities to eradicate hate. I'd like to take this license to now introduce uh, Mrs. Dawn Collins, who is with us. Uh, she's in support of these recommendations, and as you know, she's the mother of the late Lieutenant Richard Collins, who seven years ago was murdered by a young white male supremacists at U Maryland three days after graduating from Bowie State and receiving his commission as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. He was yet another casualty of unchecked hate and violence being committed by perpetrators known to law enforcement. Legislation acted, enacted in his name expanded the reach of our hate crime laws in Maryland. Lieutenant Richard Collins is why we must do this work. Under criminal justice, we are recommending uh, two uh, out of the 24, that the county council should augment the committee against hate and violence by adding representation from the state's attorney's office and the courts to one, clearly identify and define the roots and motivations behind the hate and hate incidents being committed in Montgomery County, dismantle and eliminate established hate groups and organizations, and to work in concert to identify mechanisms to prevent radicalization of perpetrators and to de-radicalize known perpetrators of hate and hate crimes. We're also recommending that the criminal justice system enforce the mandatory reporting requirements of hate and bias incidents by police, and that we hold police accountable for failing to comply with the hate and bias reporting requirement. Our black and African American adults and students are feeling the greatest impact of hate in the state and county. The state 2022 bias report shows that black people make up 35% of the victims of hate. And our study in, 20, in our report in 2022 from MCPD shows that that rate is three times higher than the next affected, affected group at 44%. And to date, black people are experiencing at least nine incidents per month inside and outside of the MCPS. Adding the state's attorney in courts would strengthen the collaboration of the Hate and Violence Committee, which already includes participation by MCPD, and bring greater focus to the individual and group perpetrators of hate violence and the need for increased arrests, prosecution, and incarcerations. Under MCPS, we are recommending the following, that MCPS create a parent advisory committee with term limits who meet directly with the superintendent to review hate bias incidents and propose recommendations. 
that it also enforced the mandatory reporting requirements of hate and bias incidents in schools and hold school administrators accountable for failing to imply, comply with a reporting requirement. From the mouths of our own very students heard in our listening sessions, they believe their complaints about hate incidents are not being heard by MCPS. Mm -hmm. Having parent advisory groups periodically meeting with our school superintendent will help ensure students' complaints are being heard and are being evaluated from top down keeping the superintendent and administrators apprised of the major incidents of hate and providing real-time solutions to resolving the same while holding those responsible within MCPS accountable. Our students continue to complain about the efficacy of the MCPS reporting system, the lack of response, and the enforcement of punishments. The current reporting system must provide clarity and uniformity on the proper use of the complaint forms and to help restore some confidence in students that their complaints will be heard and acted upon. Our recommendations coming uh, in addressing the faith and community spaces include the following. At Montgomery County Council should hold periodic listening sessions with black and African American community throughout the county, and that the County Council should work with the newly created Civil Rights Office of Maryland State's Attorney General's Office to assist, to assist with the development of civil rights policies for the state. The holding periodic listening sessions with black and African American community representatives will greatly assist the council in its decision making process concerning responses to hate occurring in respect to black communities and that fashioning solutions relevant to these communities. Also, the council working with newly created Maryland Civil Rights Office will greatly inform, help to shape, coordinate, and resource local policies and practices against hate. Now, coursing through all of these recommendations are dire needs for more and more education, financial, and people resources to respond to this enormous resurgence of hate in Montgomery County. More importantly, we are strongly recommending that this council continue this work indefinitely and act now during this state of emergency to begin to pass these and other recommendations from this cohort without delay. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wright, and thank you to the members of the African American and Black cohort. Uh, and the final presentation this morning uh, will be from Ms. Ong. Thank you. Council President, I'm Ariani Ong, the chair of the API cohort, and I'm here together with Juan Dang, Jeff Lay, May Powers, and Nazneen Safi. We have five recommendations that crossed over three areas, and these recommendations speak to strengthening community, because strong community is what keeps hate at bay from taking root and from flourishing. And strong community is the anecdote not any magic bullets. You have the full presentation, so I'm just gonna to touch upon some highlights. Recommendation number one relates to schools and youth, and that's to monitor, advise, and fully fund MCPS to implement and strengthen its anti-racism plan. Students have reported needing to be visible, so what we're asking for is funding for professional um, development training on Asian American Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, which I'll say is Anapis for short. And that's so that they understand the context. And at the very basic level, people re really need to understand that there are Asian Americans who have been here since 1763, and then there are Asians in Asia. Now, Bruce Lee, bless his heart, has been dead for about 50 years, and he wasn't an Asian American then or since he's been dead. But that's the number one person that people um, relate to when they're, they're asked about what Asian American do you know? Number two, funded culturally proficient services. When Anapi students are bullied, they're looking for people that they can relate to and who understand them. So we need Anapi counselors. But more than that, I see them turning to Anapi principals and teachers and staff. The Council's Education Cultural Committee um, to oversee the implementation of the MCPS plan. 
and specifically to ensure that responses are equitable, fair, and consistent across schools. We understand it's a fairly new plan, but th the feedback that we were getting um, was this, and that would demonstrate accountability to the public. So recommendation number two to four relates to the NAPI community. And the first one is public um, relations campaigns. In other major cities, they've used PSAs to inform the public on what a hate crime is, as well as a hate incident, where to get assistance, and how to report it. And this is particularly useful, especially for majority immigrant communities like the NAPI community. Um, the NAPIs are the group that is least likely, least likely to report. So that, that might account for some of the low numbers here in Montgomery County, but nationally it is at a historic high of about 11,400 hate incidents that were reported. Having hotlines that are staffed by people who are multilingual, but also professionally trained to provide culturally proficient services and have connections to local neighborhood organizations, because people are gonna to go to their churches and their community centers. They're not gonna call a national hotline, okay? Um, and also ensuring that the messages reach the target community where they get their news sources. A lot of Anapi immigrants rely almost exclusively on ethnic media, on ethnic social media platforms, like Kakao Talk, Line, WhatsApp. Recommendation three is to apply a racial equity lens to county decision making involving Anapis, of which are 16% now of the county population. Do we fully understand a community that spans over 20 ethnic groups? We recommend collecting and analyzing data that is broken down by ethnic groups so that we fully understand the community, its needs and its challenges, and also look at the use and the access to county programs and services. It's already being done in health services, so other ones. Two is to convene a state of Anapi summit to measure the county's progress in meeting its DEI goals with respect to Anapis. And I'm hoping that also include county support to inform the community members about what racial equity is and how it's being used in policy making and why. Three is to cultivate Anapi leaders who have been uh, who have working knowledge and connections to the community in top decision-making roles across the county government. Recommendation number four is to expand the capacity of the NAPI organizations. The NAPI community needs more than simply a couple of civic and advocacy organizations to represent the broad community interests. And so I'm not talking about health direct service providers, I'm talking about civic and advocacy organizations to speak to them and to be able to partner on anti-hate efforts, especially where that anti-hate has unique challenges and to be solidarity allies. So standing them up and then also funding navigators. Navigators are those people who could help affected parties navigate through different systems, get legal representation, compensation, insurance, and also to serve as a support companion, translator, and a uh, media spokesperson. Growing a community coalition of pan and NAPI organizations, which exist in other cities. And a model is the Montgomery County uh, Coalition for Adult English Literacy. Recommendation five, the last one, is to invest in cross-community solidarity. And implementation actions can include continuing this anti-hate task force. We have a lot of work before us. And that would include creating hate crime response plans to different scenarios, including the worst case ones, which sadly also includes mass shootings. And when that happens, it's going to involve more than just one of our cohort communities. And there's never a city that ever believes it's gonna happen to them. And they never can be fully prepared. Uh, but we have to be. And unfortunately, there are you know, so many cases to learn from. Uh, conducting practice simulations from among community groups and on the government side and in that space in the interaction between the two. Um, I've worked on this in um, LA. And so that is so that the victims assist 
received assistance sooner and they're not necessarily contacted over and over again, which would re-traumatize them from many different stakeholders. So in conclusion, we want to thank you for your support of the NAPI community. We believe these recommendations will support a NAPI residents to be self-informed, self-empowered to address hate, and NAPI organizations to be able to be partners to the county government on equity and racial justice, and a NAPI organizations to close that short history gap because we weren't fully citizens until 1952, and a lot of us weren't allowed in the country until 1965, um, so that we can have the capacity to be strong and solidarity allies. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ong, and some members of the ANAPI cohort uh, for their recommendations and for being here today. Um, you know, in, in listening to you this morning and reading the presentations which are uh, in our packet, you know, there are some common themes and recommendations that have been proposed, like training and cultural competency, uh, improved communication, uh, more convenings, uh, community outreach, uh, better uh, easing the ability to report crimes and incidents, and also the better collection, improving the collection and dissemination of the information that is received. Um, and those are just a few of the highlights. Um, very much appreciate all of your work. I'm gonna open it up to colleagues. We'll have a first round of five minutes, and then if individuals wanna go for a second round, um, some of the, the realities on an 11-member council, one year into this body. Uh, we're gonna start with Vice President Friedson, who is uh, joining us virtually. Uh, we cannot hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. President. First of all, thank you for your leadership in convening this group. I wish it wasn't as needed as it has been over this past year. Uh, and thank you to all of the cohorts and participants. It's very clear that our community is hurting, that hate is unfortunately on the rise, that Montgomery County, despite its strengths, uh, is not immune to that. And uh, we know that hate against any group is a threat to every group. And I, I think that this task force is really a reminder and a reflection of that. I, I really appreciate uh, all the presentations today, appreciate everything that uh, you have shared in the packet. Uh, as the council president noted, there's a lot of ties that bind the recommendations, training, education, cultural competency and proficiency in public schools, among public safety professionals and public employees. Uh, we have a lot of work to do to improve the process for reporting hate bias incidents, to respond to them properly, to collect the data on them. I do think that uh, we do better than most, but not nearly as uh, as well as we should, as we need to, uh, to address the, the scourge of, of, of hate that we're seeing uh, in our community. It is a very scary time, and I just appreciate the uh, professionalism and, and expertise and the lived experiences that, that so many of you have brought uh, to this. So uh, thank you for that. I look forward to uh, digging into this further, uh, to continuing this work, to looking through and uh, figuring out how we can operationalize uh, some of these recommendations as quickly as possible. Uh, and um, just uh, really appreciate everyone's efforts up to this point. Thank you, Vice President Friedson. Uh, now we'll turn to Council Member Jawando. Thank you, and also want to echo thanks uh, to the, all the commission members, the cohorts, to uh, Selena and Berta, and to Council President Glass and his staff for taking the initiative. Uh, it was it was really um, I was thankful to participate in the last meeting uh, last week, and have had uh, the opportunity to also participate in some of the breakouts, uh, but also my staff has participated all along the way. Um, as I said that evening. Uh, you know, there's a lot of pain and uh, emotion at this time in particular because of what's going on around the world, right? And I think one of the things we always say, one in three of our residents are foreign born, but that means that they, they're feeling the pain of all the global conflicts all the time. Um, and I think, I just think this presentation underscores that. Um, obviously, we have acute issues going on right now in the Jewish community, in the Muslim community, in the LGBTQ+, Latinx, Anapi, and Black and African American communities. 
but there has been and continues to be uh, one of the things I've been struck by is that we have this issue going on in our community all the time. It spikes. Um, and this has really forced us to, I think in a good way, to say we, ha we, we have to do something about it. We've always been a welcoming community. And what we say from this dais, uh, for the majority, I'm proud to work with council members that care about our community, but we have to do more. It's clear. It's clear. Um, I said in my capacity as the chair of the Education Cultural Committee, and I appreciate all of the recommendations that relate to MCPS. Uh, we are, uh, and I've talked to the superintendent, I've talked to many of her staff about this. We just took up the anti-racist uh, audit uh, here in the committee earlier this week, uh, or last week, I'm sorry, the weeks are running together. Um, but we will take up your recommendations and have sessions on this topic in the committee. I commit to you that. Uh, I know other uh, committees in the council will also be uh, doing that and be concerned in that. Um, the imperative that we protect everyone in our community, that they feel safe to express themselves, to report hate bias incidents, uh, to be who they are in their own skin, uh, and that when they do step out and take the courage, courageous step of saying something happened, that there is an appropriate uh, response and healing that takes place um, and accountability. Uh, all that has to happen. Um, and I know uh, we agree with that, but we have work to do to make sure that happens every time. Um, and so we're going to be working with our school board and our in school system partners to do that, as well as with every county agency. We expect that of every county agency to be competent, to be understanding, to be caring. Um, and we know we have work to do. You know, I, we, we diversified quickly in Montgomery County. Uh, when I was born 40 years ago, I'll, I'll be 41 in January, this county was 85 plus percent. I'm sorry to make you feel old, Ron. Yeah, I saw, I saw you make a face. This, this county was major, that the 85 percent plus white uh, and, and to, had not yet experienced the massive immigration boom that happened. And so, it's not an excuse, it's just a reality of what we are. And so we are still grappling, like with so many county systems, how to be the place that we all love. And part of how to be that is to make sure that everyone is, is welcome, that we set the tone from the highest levels, that we set up the systems and structures to keep people safe, uh, and we educate people in all forms about our community. And that's an ongoing process, uh, but at the, I think at the core of what we're talking about today. I know I'm committed to it. I know my colleagues are committed to it. And I thank you all for the time and energy you put into this work. Um, and we'll be following up uh, in due course. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. I, I want to thank Council President Glass for convening this very important discussion. But I also want to thank each of you, not only for the work on the committee, and I know that it was a lot of work, but for all the work that you do every day in our community. Uh, many of you have wear so many hats in the community, and thank you so much for all the work that you do. Um, I, too, was struck by a lot of similar themes as I read through the, uh, the packet. Um, reporting and making sure that um, not that people feel comfortable reporting so we know so all communities know how to report who to report and that they're going to be listened to and I think that that was one of the things that struck me is it's not just uh, it's not just enough to have a hotline but we need to make sure that everybody feels safe and heard so I think that's important um, and then also from the perspective of um, uh, cultural competencies. We had a pretty robust discussion last week or so when we talked with MCPS about the anti-hate uh, programs that they do. And one of the things that came up was the cultural competencies of staff. And, and that goes not only for MCPS, but for every department in the county. Not everyone comes to this discussion with the same background, the same um, intellect, the same uh, comfort, and so I think that we need to do a much better job of making sure that everyone uh, is coming from a place of 
wanting to look at this and take a really deep dive and have the cultural competency to do that. So I think that's important. Um, Montgomery County, we um, celebrate our diversity every day. We all talk about our diversity and the strength of diversity, uh, but we, we need to really make sure that people are safe. So again, it's not just, it, we can't just um, celebrate and claim that because we have a diverse community that we've uh, that we have succeeded we have to make sure that everybody feels safe so uh, this work is really important with that um, I appreciate the uh, the recommendation about support for community infrastructure and civic infrastructure uh, that's an area where um, empowered groups feel empowered and so we need to make sure that uh, all of our communities have the support that they um, that they have to do the work and to feel that support. So I think, uh, from my perspective, um, civic infrastructure, community infrastructure is so very important. Um, and so I think I, I, I wanted to lift that up. Um, again, MCPS, a lot of the uh, comments were made uh, um, in regard to our MCPS population. Um, we don't have a lot of control over that, but um, I appreciate uh, Council Member Jawando's uh, commitment to really looking at that, and, and I think everyone would want to do that. I do all, also want to thank um, Council Member Friedson for his leadership in the past couple of months. We've had a very, uh, the, the, the communi our, our community, the world, has been in a very difficult place, and um, I know that our Jewish community, our Muslim community, is really hurting right now. And I appreciate that um, uh, your your courage in going through this at a very difficult time. So I appreciate that. Um, and so um, I think we're committed to this being the beginning of the conversation. Several of you said that today, that this cannot be the end of it. This can't be a report that we put on the shelf. So thank you all for being here today and all the hard work that you've done. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Balcom, and I'll, I'll pick up on where, what you just said. We're in the middle of this conversation. Um, it has been going on for a while. It was uh, picked up during the summer with more than 50 meetings uh, by all of these incredible individuals and community members, and we do have to continue it. Uh, Councilmember Stewart. Thank you. Um, thank you. I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who uh, stepped up and participated in um, this work. We, you know, in Montgomery County, we have a lot of committees, task force, boards, and things. But this one was particularly special because we were asking all of you to spend a great deal of time um, out of your days to work on these issues, to meet. And we also know the emotional toll that this work takes to really do. And I just want to say I appreciate all of you for putting in that work as well because from that, we've received a great deal of information from you all on how we can move forward in our community. Um, and I know that was painful at times. And I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you. Um, I had the honor to um, be on some of the Zooms, and I, I've talked to some of you individually about this work. And um, I want to thank um, Council President Glass for helping to move this forward, and to Selena and Berta for your excellent work um, as well. Um, you know, many of my colleagues have already talked about, and Council President Glass did an excellent job of kind of tying together the themes um, that are common across. Um, and I want to pull out, again, just the importance of um, really looking at the reporting. Um, and, and thank you, uh, because I think this is also about ongoing learning, and we all have to be open to that ongoing learning. Um, and language is so important in all of this as well. Um, and what language we use. Um, and so thank you uh, for particularly uh, pointing out um, the correct anapi um, and uh, how we're talking about and communicating with different communities. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, so I think the reporting is something that we will uh, continue to work on and look at. Um, continuing 
seeing how this group uh, in some ways uh, can continue because I think it is ongoing work. And we've talked about here about the need for, you know, we are a diverse community and the need for inclusion. And right now, I think over the last few months, we've talked about the importance of safety and protecting people, which is of utmost importance for everyone in our community. And we also need to talk about how we can ensure that people thrive and can be their true selves wherever they are in our community whether that's in school, at the grocery store, or wherever, no one should be afraid of being their true selves. And that's the work we have ahead of us. And I feel like we have taken a big step forward given the work that you all have done. And I look forward to continuing this journey with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Stewart. Councilmember Ludke. Thank you. Um, and I know I've had the personal privilege of working with some of you in the past um, and it's just it's just sad that it keeps getting worse right no matter um, what we've tried that being said it means we have to just be more recommitted to doing this work day in and day out there is no time for pause there is no time for a break and there is no reprieve um, this is something that is constantly festering and that we have to have attention on at all times um, I, I want to um, there were a couple of things that were raised and I really appreciate each of the different cohorts work and, and each of the things that you surfaced and certainly as already noted there were a lot a lot of overlap in those pieces um, one thing that we at the Public Safety Committee had, had the opportunity to hear not too long ago, um, and Mr. Vasco, as this, this came up when you were speaking, was that the cadet program for high school students that um, the police department has with MCPS, half of the class was Latinx now, which is a very good thing, um, including students who didn't speak English and other students who were bilingual who were helping them and working with them together and they were talking about and discussing how well that was working and again how well that community forming within that cohort of, of people who were learning that will benefit our community down the road which is incredibly important um, and I want to thank those who raised the need for additional staff training because not everything while we know there's specific training for law enforcement officers directly the f uh, the report that ends up going to the state for the state's hate bias and hate crimes annual report is a forum that the Maryland State Police have that forum is not com is not completed by the patrol officer the person who's out in the community someone in their central records unit sees whatever reports come in and then decides if there was something in that report that ends up there so there are multiple opportunities for there to be a gap in my ideal world and I know and I'm looking at Meredith because she knows I've asked for this for years there would be an app or an electronic tool that patrol officers could use directly that would complete the report. You could still have supervisor sign off. Let me say it louder. You could still have supervisor sign off before it goes to MSP. But that would facilitate the person who's there day in and day out actually completing that form. And that helps tie in the, the view of whatever is before them of asking those extra questions to dive down into the why of what is happening and what is going on. Um, for a lot of the hate bias incidents, which are non-arrestable, there's no crime, and it is un <laughs> I say this, I, I appreciate our constitutional rights. I also appreciate that I'm not always happy about hate speech. Why would I be? It's ugly. It causes discomfort. It creates anxiety in our communities, and yet we live within that framework. And so you can come right up to the brink, and trust me, some people are very, very highly skilled at coming right up to the brink and not crossing that line into criminal conduct. And it, it destroys our communities. Um, but if we're making a 311 call, is the person on the receiving end of the 311 or non-emergency number adept at probing that this might be a hate bias incident, might not be a crime, might not need to send someone out, right? But you still should be taking the report. And that's what we're missing. So I really appreciate the, the highlight of the need for that. Um, 
vandalism incidents are ones where often we don't find the person who committed the vandalism, yet the visual display of hate is significant. And so we should try to be more creative about ways we can try to discern who who is committing those things, particularly if there's a known pattern, like, for example, student assemblies that were happening. And then subsequently, within 24 to 48 hours of those assemblies, there was a school that was re experiencing repeated acts of vandalism that were hate-based. Um, that's stuff that we need to do a better job of following up on and keeping an eye on and paying attention to. And I really want to thank um, Ms. Ong for raising the thing that's really, really difficult to talk about, which is mass violence. And um, I, I know others here have heard me say, I wish I didn't know as much about that topic as I do, um, because it, it's hard. And I know that we have great training throughout the state on responding after the thing has occurred. Ooh. I don't know if that's a fire alarm or not, but. Um, we don't always do the best job of preventing things before they get to that. So you want to say we want to focus our efforts at left of boom, right, and understanding better the psychology of that and how to determine when something is a bias incident or where it's just festering, someone's failing to let go of a grievance and where they're starting on a targeted pathway toward violence. That is often dependent on the individual observations of someone who lives very closely to or directly near that person who has to observe those subtle changes and know to not be dismissive of those things. And that has been a challenge that we have experienced for a very long time. It creates grave consequences consequences for our community, and we all owe an obligation to teach others about that and um, to make sure they know where and how to report when they think something is not okay, even if it doesn't rise to the level of a crime, because it's not our job to discern that. We still have to report it. Let someone else figure that out. So thank you. Um, I really, truly, truly appreciate that. And to Ms. Collins, I really, truly appreciate you. Um, I, I was actually in the Judiciary Committee when you were down to testify about the bill. And I so appreciate, in substantial part, it's a few words. They are very significant words. And I, I thank you for your advocacy. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Council Member Fanny Gonzalez. I'll keep it brief. Um, again, my name is Natalie Fanny Gonzalez. I think you all are one of the reasons why Montgomery County is such a beautiful and welcoming place. Regardless of all everything that has been said, I think the majority of cases, you know, for the most part, we are uh, an amazing place to live. And as an immigrant who decided to come here, I'm proud to live in Montgomery County. And I think it's our duty and my duty as an immigrant to ensure that the county continues to evolve, you know, to embrace everybody, our differences, and our beauty. Uh, so two things that stood out for me, lots of stuff happened, right, from your reports, but two things that I think are, are things that I feel that I wanna see right away. I'm gonna have a friendly request, I, um, because I'm not in any of these committees. Um, I'm gonna uh, ask for a joint session between HHS, and I see my friend Gabriel Bornos, and GEO, because as people were talking, I was thinking of the Gilchrist Center mm -hmm. that serves the immigrant population. And one of their offices is actually in my district in beautiful Wheaton. Um, so I would love to know, uh, you know, what are they up to, but also how they can incorporate some of this pretty timely and amazing recommendation. So that's, mm -hmm. that's one thing. So I leave it up to you to move that forward. Is that good? Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, I'll be there. I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm not in your committee. So there you go. Um, and then, um, you know, we we have a history of offering community grants to nonprofits, and we should always continue doing that. Um, uh, again, as an immigrant, when I came to this country, it was Casa, that place that I went to to get, you know, to to, to understand you know, the rights that I have, but also what services I could use. I was undocumented, I didn't have health insurance, I didn't know what the school to go to. So CASA was my 
place to go. So just uplifting that, that um, their services, just like many other nonprofits, do the same thing or try to. Um, it's, it's very important uh, for us to continue supporting. Uh, and then what else can I say? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it to that require. Oh, oh, the the other thing, um, and this is for the chair of public safety who he has he had to step out for a second. Um, the it's concerning, you know, among among your responses or comments, the fact that even today is difficult, almost impossible to report a hate crime to our local police. So looking into that, making sure that maybe we should do, I mean, one of the recommendations that somebody said was creating an MC, a Montgomery County Police Department uh, hate crime liaison. I think that was a term used. Uh, yeah, that. Um, we should seriously look into that because no one should have fear that, you know, I, I fa you know I'm facing this hate crime and there's no way for me to report it or like, there's not an efficient way to report it. It shouldn't be like that. So I think between the Gilchrist Center update and the uh, Hanta Hate Liaison for the Montgomery County Police, I'm just gonna talk about that. It's this, those two are very critical in my view. Um, and uh, that's it, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Fonda Gonzalez. As you note, there's a lot of recommendations. There's a lot of work to do. None of this is gonna be siloed or stovepiped. Uh, and we all will be part of these ongoing discussions uh, here at the council and in the community as well. Uh, Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you, President Glass, for so much. Um, and, and I really do appreciate your leadership on this. None of us could have predicted how prescient and important this group is, particularly right now in this moment. And um, when I had the opportunity to attend uh, the Latino Hispanic cohort, one of the first questions that Alex posed to the group was, describe a personal incident of hate or bias that you or somebody in your family experienced. It was a super emotional moment um, for everybody around that table. And I know all of you, all of the members of your respective cohorts, all of the members of this dais have experienced personally or by extension our families uh, hate or bias in ways that we suppress to move, be able to move on, but we know are very difficult to process. And if we pull the thread on this work as chair of the Health and Human Services Committee, we're seeing the public health ramifications of the stress and the pain and the anguish that all of us are feeling, but particularly right now. And it's most acutely being felt in the mental health space, but it is having very serious public health ramifications in a variety of other categories. And so it's important, probably more than ever, for us to create these authentic places and time where we can have very difficult conversations that we choose to avoid sometimes just to be able to move forward. But we must listen, we must act, and there are very solid and reasonable recommendations throughout all of your reports. Some of them low-hanging fruit, things that we can do right away, things that won't cost any money. Others that will take a little bit more time. This was a legislative function. And so I understand why it had a beginning and an end in terms of this particular cohort. But as has been acknowledged, this work obviously needs to continue. And the good news is we're not starting from scratch. There is an infrastructure in place within the executive branch that has been doing incredibly effective work, much of which all of us have had the opportunity to work alongside with. But as we meet this current moment now, it's obvious to me that we need to think about how we transition some of these recommendations in order to make them sustainable and institutionalize them not just now, but for future generations. The other observations that I'll make as you all were speaking were that some of this pain is most being felt by our youth. Um, and you know, having been in the youth development field most of my professional career, um, I can tell you that there are not enough authentic places 
for, for us to be able to engage and talk to youth. And I really um, feel for MCPS because they obviously are the shepherds of the most precious commodity that we have as a government. Uh, they are the most clear entity, but they need help. They need all of our help. And it's incumbent upon all of us to assist them in figuring out how we create that time and space, both within the classroom, but also systemically as well. Because there are still institutions of racism and bias within our government infrastructure that are compounding the problem. We have to do many of the recommendations that have been made, you know, the audits, the evaluation of our current systems and programs to make sure that they are culturally competent. Those are things that we should be doing all the time, and we are, but clearly we need to do a better job of. But I'll sort of leave with, with this comment. The other thing that I loved about this group is that we created the time and place. And Berta and Selina, you guys were unbelievable. Um, and the updates that you all provided to the council throughout this entire process were incredibly helpful to all of us. But in this instance, government set the table. But this was community driven. And the recommendations are community driven. And while some of the recommendations, understandably, and I agree with, require, require a government construct, additional staff positions, a new, a, a new initiative, um, but it needs to remain community driven. And in the next phase of this, we have to figure out how to authentically cross pollinate this work. Because I often feel Montgomery County feels like a high school cafeteria sometimes. Uh, and we have to do a better job ourselves, me included, of helping to work collaboratively among our groups because that is when we are really going to be cooking with gas. That is when we are going to break through some of the silos that we are all feeling and are real and raw, but that will ultimately get us to a better place and become the community we all want Montgomery County to be. There is so much to be proud of, but obviously a lot more work to do. I'm committed to it. I know my colleagues are as well. And I can't thank you all enough for your dedication and commitment. You all carry personally a lot of weight here. You feel like this tremendous responsibility to stand up your community, be leaders in your family. It's heavy. It's hard. It's exhausting. Um, but I appreciate you doing it because it's making a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, Councilmember Sales. Uh, thank you, Council President Glass, and thank you to all of our cohort members. Um, the policy solutions that you have recommended um, are thoughtful and robust and reflects uh, the inclusive um, representatives that um, convened this task force. Um, I was really glad that my staff and myself uh, really appreciated talking with and meeting with some of the members throughout uh, these discussions. Um, as we've all heard, we've witnessed a rise in uh, these hate incidents, as, um, especially within our schools, as many have mentioned. Um, so I'm glad to hear that many of the recommendations involve working uh, with MCPS and our youth, getting young people to uh, resist the learned behavior they witness at home will take time to unlearn uh, these behaviors um, and to lead with compassion as they become more culturally uh, competent to stand against hate. Um, there was also mention of working with our public safety officials, so I look forward to um, if uh, my colleague and chair of the Health and Human Services takes this on you know, having joint meetings with our Public Safety Committee and our Education and Culture Committee to ensure that our public safety officials, um, uh, their, not only their, our workforce reflects the diversity of our community, um, but also um, ensuring that their training is up to date and timely is also important. Um, it's vital that we start with our young people who are the future of this county um, to ensure that they are uh, fully versed in the work moving forward. Um, so while this signals the end of the anti-hate task force meetings, I hope each of our cohorts continue to stay involved 
um, your leadership, your voices and perspectives are integral um, as we move forward. Uh, finally, I would like to extend my deep appreciation to Selena Singleton and uh, Bertha uh, Serzosima um, for uh, their leadership. Um, Selena as our racial equity manager and Bertha as our multicultural communication and outreach manager for your hard work in shepherding this group through the process. Um, many of these recommendations involve changing or altering how we function as county government and you are both critical in this process to its success. And so I just had a few questions um, about this if there's time for you to answer. Um, how will this work influence um, uh, the mission of the Committee on Hate and Violence? How um, will these recommendations influence its work or replace this body's efforts? Um, and then one other question. You know, when we were experiencing racial unrest following the murder of George Floyd, we passed the racial equity and social justice law. We created tools to evaluate how we form decisions for our diverse communities. I'd also like you to provide some critical action steps you feel we can take as a council um, and our county government to not only tackle and evaluate these recommendations, but to truly change how we conduct business to foster a safer and more welcoming community. Um, and I'll just close with um, that. Well, and thank you all again for all the cohorts for your hard work and uh, you have my full support to ensure we continue this mission to root out hate in our communities. I don't know if they have time to answer questions. They do. Is there someone you wanted to address the question to? Well, um, to Selena and Bertha and anyone else from the cohort who wants to um, recommend how we evaluate these recommendations going forward. Hi, good morning. Uh, so, and thank you for that question. Uh, to your first question about the Committee on Hate Violence, um, the chair of that committee is sitting right behind us if she might want to come up and speak, Lisa Taylor. Um, and uh, Director Stowe is also here. They can also, he can also speak to that in particular. If, sorry to put you all on the spot, but sorry, not sorry. Um, <laughs> And then to the other question, you know, we've had a lot of conversations here about racial equity and social justice. Um, continue those conversations. How do we pull together the recommendations of the county executive, the county council, um, MCPS, and the police department seems to be another conversation that we ought to have together first. Yeah. Um, and then clearly there are a number of recommendations that are very specific. So how do we both parse them out? And also as Council President Evan Glass said, they're not siloed, they're not stove so how do we then put them back together and sort of determine how to work through those? Um, as I was listening to you all, I was trying to think of what are some of the things that you all said, you know, and what are some of the priorities, mm -hmm. and how do we figure that out with our community leaders? Um, and so I would love to see them, um, getting myself some more work, but love to see them um, at another table to talk about, you know, what are some of the priorities and how do we do that? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Again, my name is Lisa Taylor. I am the chair of the Committee Against Hate Violence. I want to thank you for that very good question. Um, so uh, the Committee Against Hate Violence is made up of members that are elected, um, are appointed by our uh, county executive, and they represent all members throughout our community. And so we have been longstanding in existence um, and appreciate the work of the Anti-Hate Task Force. Um, to my side here, I have Director Stowe, who works in tandem with the Committee Against Hate Violence, um, and he's the Director of the Office of Human Rights. So to, to your point, uh, we, and we've both been very active in the Anti-Hate Task Force, and so um, what, what we've learned is pretty much what we already know, because we do have monthly meetings whereby we are um, hearing from members of our community, including um, the Community Engagement Office for the Police Department, which is run by Captain Jordan Satinsky, who talks about the monthly bias, bias and hate incidences for the county. We also work with the school system and have school system representatives, including uh, Mr. Monteleone, who I see here is today. 
Um, and so we are going to continue the work that we have been doing. Um, and I think the best place is to look at the recommendations by subject matter, because we have many, um, and then working with the county council as well as with other leaders in the community to address these ongoing issues. Um, many of the uh, recommendations are recommendations that we um, are familiar with and, um, and continue to support, um, and then would just continue to ask the county council to uh, help us with funding, because we have asked for things like increasing to the partnership fund, which is a fund that we provide to victims to make them whole. We've also asked for um, more presence in our, commi uh, our committee, including that of the school system, but also to include now the state's attorney's office, because we have seen um, perhaps uh, allegations of under uh, prosecution of um, hate crimes, um, but also looking at how we can do better at our reporting for um, once we receive what we do, because we do see a consistent um, issue with the school system. Um, and so we work again with uh, the folks there to continue the progress. And I think it was well said that this is not something that happens overnight. This is going to be an ongoing challenge, and we look forward to our continued partnership uh, with the county council. And I, sh I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Council Member Mink actually attends our meetings. And we really appreciate that as presence, but also to understand firsthand um, the experiences of the folks who uh, are in our communities. And I will stop there and ask Director Stowe if he wants to add anything. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, thank you uh, for the work that you do and the other members of our Committee Against Hate Violence. Uh, and they have been working very, very hard uh, over these many years on these issues. Uh, but my friends, I think that we are back at a, a very, uh, unfortunately, uh, a traditional place where we are motivated by the particular issue of the day. Um, we have to stop that. If we're going to make a commitment to this cause. Yeah. This is not, again, new. Nothing has been said across this panel is new. Uh, there's been spikes, obviously, that you've heard, uh, and, and that's awful. But it's awful every day for somebody in Montgomery County. And so we have to ask ourselves, is this or is this not a priority? If it's not, then, then we continue to have then the spikes occur. If it's a priority, my friends, it just seems to me, then that there ought to be then real meaningful change over time and consistent yeah. that allows us then to do the best job possible for our customers who are the residents of this fine community. That's where we are. Uh, this is not hard in that particular degree. What is more difficult is to figure out where it places itself in terms of our many, many priorities against the resources that we have in this community. I get that. I really do. But at some point, we cannot expect then the outcomes that we really think are important. And I think all of you do see that, and certainly all the members of these various cohorts see it, and members of our community at large. But we cannot really grasp the outcomes that we really are seeking if we have, again, stops and starts. Starts where we, again, are motivated by, again, issues that are critical to our community. We hear the outcry coming from citizens, residents, our community. And then we, again, aggressively, uh, again, to try to, again, immediate those things. But once the urgency goes away, we, in fact, don't have the same level of, again, importance for that particular thing that we just dealt with. That, that's what the issue is. This, 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 this is who we are. This is Montgomery County. And I said some of you many times ago, doing this adversity thing is hard work. Trying to have everybody at the table, be able to have their own mind, their own voice, to be able to speak to the, that, that particular truth, whatever it may end up being, and be able to hear that, particularly when it does, in fact, support your position. That's difficult work. And I don't necessarily that we really got, have grasped that to the extent for which we have a, such a wonderful opportunity in Montgomery County to do something unlike any place else in America. I liken it oftentimes to the fact that we are not trying to climb Mount Everest, as some communities are, in tennis shoes. Mm -hmm. There's some communities that really, really have this issue that they can't even see the light on the other side of the corner, right? Around the corner. But Montgomery County can. But I'm hoping, I really am hoping that, that, that this time, 
that now you've got the attention from all these folks across this panel that we won't just stop with, again, the revival experience we're having this morning. Revivals are great. <laughs> but that we'd have the opportunity then to make this be a sustainable kind of effort. Yeah. That next year and the year after we see meaningful changes in our community that go right back to this day, December the 5th, that we heard from this group of folks and we had a council who heard what they in fact saw in person and heard in person that there is meaningful change as a direct result of this particular gathering together today. So again, uh, Councilman Sells, I, I, I think that there is a natural pass off for some things uh, to your very specific question to the Committee Against Hate Violence. But as our chair has said, without the resources and the focus <clears throat> and the commitment, then we can do something but we can't do the bold things. B-O-L-D, the bold things. We cannot do those things. And so I'm hoping that we can do the bold things, the things that makes us different in a great place where we think we are to live in the state of Maryland and the United States of America. That, that's, that's doable here. That, that's not just words being said. That is doable. And so I'm hopeful uh, that, again, we have the opportunity then to make this happen uh, can there be changes? Can there be additional revisions and help and support? Absolutely. And so I look forward to those opportunities then to have that again added to what we're trying to get done today. But we've got to have the initial support. And I'm hoping, like I said before, that this is the beginning of something new and different, unlike previous conversations that had good intentions, but no follow through. Thank you. We must maintain the urgency. That's my takeaway, and I think you have our full commitment. Thank you, everyone. Uh, th thank you, Councilmember Sales um, and Ms. Taylor and, and, and Mr. Stowe. Uh, to your point, uh, this is a public document. This is something to uh, check back on, to grade ourselves on, uh, and to, to wave in the community to express the progress that we need to move forward. Uh, and so this, this will continue um, and appreciate your work and, and the, the, the committee's work as well. Um, and speaking of the committee, the, the council's uh, designee to that committee uh, is Council Member Mink, and glad she attends all those meetings. Uh, we, uh, I, I, I refer to I refer to these as as extracurricular. Uh, outside of our committee work here, outside of our council work, uh, each of us are on various other boards, uh, committees, and commissions, and we are pleased that that Council Member Mink uh, is our appointee on the Committee Against Hate Violence. So I'll turn it over to Council Member Mink. I can't believe I'm supposed to follow <laughs> <laughs> Director Stowe. <laughs> you, I mean, you really, you really said it all. I, I'm so grateful to each of the cohorts, to each member of the of the cohorts. Your work has been, it has been said, but I'll say it again: emotionally taxing. Uh, I know, but incredibly important and valuable. Um, and I wanted to start with something that Mr. Vasquez said that really struck me, that many see these incidents of hate bias as simply part of their experience mm -hmm. of being, uh, in your cohort's case, Latinx. But not only is that uh, heartbreaking, but I would bet that that is a reality in every single one of these cohorts. And it truly shows the depth of the work that we have before us. We absolutely need to dig into the many similarities that we saw crossing all of these cohorts, as well as some that are specific to the cohorts. Um, there were, uh, I wanted to just note a few from, one from each uh, that I think uh, is, was, was really um, uh, dug into by each of you, but I think that also crosses the, bound, the boundaries. Um, we heard from Ms. Khan about the need to hear unequivocally from leaders in word and in action that we reject anti-Muslim and the anti-Arab hate. I would think that certainly crosses across each of these cohorts as well. We heard from Mr. Downey the need for resources targeted to the LGBTQ plus community 
That's something that I think crosses each of these cohorts as well. We heard from Mr. Vasquez the need for far more robust translation and interpretation capabilities across government. We heard from Ms. Weisel the importance of the education of our young people, of ensuring they are receiving authentic histories uh, in, in our curriculums, in our schools, in all the places where they are. We heard from Mr. Wright about the need to work across our local and state entities to weaken and dismantle white supremacists and other hate groups that cause fear and violence and work to radicalize members of our communities. We heard from Ms. Ong about reaching our communities where they are, communicating not just in the languages needed to reach residents, but in the places and the spaces where they actually are and where they feel safe. And everyone spoke about improving and creating more effective accountability measures in addressing hate bias incidents. I also love the anti-hate ombudsman idea, Ms. Khan. Um, but as we just heard from, not but, and, as we just heard from Director Stowe, we also need accountability measures to hold us responsible for taking action on these recommendations. And I don't think it's unrelated that we heard from many of you as a recommendation that these cohorts continue. And given the importance and the quality of the work that you all have done and as accountability tool for us, I think it would be of tremendous benefit to us and to the public that we find the right format for that to happen. There is unfortunately no shortage of work to be done in the hate bias space. As, as we've seen in the Committee Against Heat and Violence where they do tremendous work as well. And we have before us now a large group of residents who have been willing to spend their time, their energy, their emotional energy, and contribute their expertise to this conversation, and who are telling us that they are willing to continue to do so in whatever format, again, might be appropriate. Um, but I just don't want it to go unnamed, uh, that we should not let that go to waste. So I look forward to hopefully continuing the conversation about how we can uh, uh, you know, take advantage of and show our appreciation for, but truly take advantage of that opportunity before us uh, to bring these different um, opportunities uh, to do this work together and continue to expand our work. Um, and uh, with deep, deep gratitude, uh, I look forward to um, also ensuring that we have means, um, increased means, to hold us accountable for taking action on the recommendations that we have heard today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Mink. Um, as you have heard from all of us, you have our full commitment to doing this hard work, and it is hard, Director Stowe, as you note. Uh, living in one of the most diverse communities in the entire country has its benefits and its joys, um, and it's hard to make sure that everyone's voices are heard, even when they disagree, but they're both working towards a better future for not only themselves, but our community as a whole. And this conversation uh, is definitely not at the beginning, but it's not at the end. And we pledge ourselves to doing all of this work with you and with the thousands of people who are not in this room uh, who care about this work, because we all ultimately want Montgomery County to be a safe and welcoming place for everybody. And ultimately, that's what this is about. And so, again, uh, our deep appreciation to every member of this task force and those who provided their input, um, Ms. Singleton, Ms. Sarisomosomo, Bertha, thank you. Um, I also want to extend our appreciation to Iqua Nguyen, um, who uh, helped make all of these online meetings possible, um, which are online and available for everyone to watch. If you have questions about any of these discussions, um, nearly 50 meetings are online 
Um, and this report is online, the PowerPoint presentations, and so we're going to continue referring back to them, judging ourselves against them, and we need you to judge us against them as well. Uh, this is a partnership, uh, and that's the only way that our community is going to move forward. And so uh, I also want to extend appreciation to my staff, but you will hear more about that later today. Um, so um, thank you to everybody who is here. Let's continue this very important conversation. Um, the residents of Montgomery County are depending on it. So thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, we are now going to move on to a legislative day, legislative day number 34, and there are two bills for introduction today. The first is Bill 4323, Crisis Intervention Team Established. The lead sponsor is Councilmember Ludke. I'll turn it over to Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, today I am introducing Bill 4323, Crisis Intervention Team Established. This legislation would improve our county's response to individuals in crisis using a model that is effective at de-escalating violent situations, diverting individuals from the criminal justice system, and increasing access to needed follow-up services. Specifically, this bill aims to create Crisis Intervention Teams, or CIT, as a joint program of Department of Health and Human Services and the Montgomery County Police Department. Each team would be composed of one clinician and one officer who co-locate, co-deploy, and co-respond to individuals who are experiencing a behavioral health crisis and pose a danger to themselves and or others. I wanna emphasize that because this is not to take the place of our existing mobile crisis teams and certainly where it's determined that a clinician only response is the most appropriate, that should be continued. The CIT model prioritizes a more efficient and appropriate allocation of resources by making sure that the right people respond to a call and recognizing that we have a spectrum of needs and a wide spectrum of types of service calls. Central to the CIT program and the overarching goal of enhancing and streamlining our county's crisis response is this bill's requirement that DHHS and the Montgomery County Police Department ratify a memorandum of understanding that delineates individual and shared responsibilities, identifies opportunities for data and resource sharing, and facilitates greater communication, collaboration, and trust between those departments for the betterment of our residents. The bill would establish an advisory community, sorry, committee of stakeholders, both inside and outside of county government, who will collaborate with advocates, identify best practices, and inform the CIT team's procedures. This advisory body will also liaise with the new state CIT Center for Excellence, which was created via legislation in 2020 at the state level within the Governor's Office of Crime Prevention, Youth and Victim Services, for the purpose of issuing guidance to our local jurisdictions, our counties, so that CIT is adopted and implemented by all Maryland jurisdictions in a coordinated fashion. Our county has made great strides in building up our crisis response system. This bill would ensure that our system is cohesive and navigable. CIT is a vital part of the larger landscape of interventions and wraparound services that are equally important in preventing and mitigating behavioral health crises in the first place. As noted previously, this bill does not alter or interfere with the work of the crisis center or the clinician-only mobile crisis outreach teams. Rather, this bill adds another option to the menu of options available for crisis response. 
Crises can be present in a wide variety of ways and our systems should have the flexibility to meet folks where they are. As the experts, the Crisis Center and Emergency Communication Center will continue to determine whether a situation constitutes a safety risk to the individual in crisis or to the responding clinician. And MCOTs will continue to be empowered to respond without law enforcement when there isn't a safety risk present. One other uh, point I should have made when I was discussing the fact that there is an advisory committee that will be advising the work of the CIT is that inherent in this is a need to flush out our county's sequential intercept model that relates to those individuals who may be experiencing a mental behavioral health crisis and also have um, an underlying criminal related issue, the priority being to divert them to treatment rather than to the criminal justice system. Um, so the sequential intercept model, I do wanna note, is for adults. There are other models that apply to children, um, and, and that is a separate issue. Um, since the January Joint Health and Human Services and Public Safety Briefing that we held about behavioral health crisis response, I've collaborated with stakeholders who work on this issue in our county and also consulted with other jurisdictions to learn about their best practices in order to create a bill, the bill you see here before you today. Thank you for your consideration and I welcome a robust discuss discussion of this legislation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Ludke. Ms. Wellens, anything to add? Nothing to add, thank you, Mr. Very President. good, thank you. Uh, there will be a public hearing on this item scheduled for January 16th at 1.30 in the afternoon. And with that, this bill is introduced. Thank you. The next item is Bill 4423, Human Rights and Civil Liberties, Prospective Employees, Healthcare Privacy. The lead sponsors are Council Members Albernaz and Ludke. Council Member Albernaz. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and it was an honor to work with Councilmember Lutke as co-lead for this important piece of legislation, which builds off of Bill 523, which was uh, sponsored by all of us and unanimously passed, that helps ensure that our private um, health information remains just that, private. Um, I was shocked and really appreciate um, my colleagues when they first came on board and noticed right away uh, the outdated and really inappropriate uh, health care information that was asked of all of you and your teams as you came on board this council. That same protection should be extended to all of our county residents, not just government and county employees. And so what this bill aims to do is ensure that uh, requests for uh, health information are only related to job requirements and it prohibits employers from requesting any sexual and reproductive health information which we have seen unfortunately be weaponized in other parts of our country and we must ensure not happen here in our community. The bill will also provide greater protections than currently found under Maryland state law by not allowing employers to request intrusive unwarranted health care information from applicants. Uh, our teams have had the opportunities to engage with our chambers. We will talk to other partners, um, but thus far there has been nothing but support um, once you explain what this is and what it is not. And I also want to note that the vast majority of our employers in Montgomery County are not asking for this intrusive information, but we wanted to ensure that we codified in law the same protections that we are affording our county government employees. I want to thank Ms. Wellens as well, as always, um, for her hard work and working with our respective offices. And I look forward to the further conversation on this. And I yield back to you, Mr. President. I'm sure Councilmember Ludke will want to say some comments as well. Uh, indeed, Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank um, our HHS chair, Council, uh, our Committee Chair and Council Member Albernaz, too many titles all at once, but he's fabulous, for working on this and pushing the ball forward. Um, this is really important that we have a uniform landscape in our county. It should benefit all our employees in a standard fashion. Um, those questions that were personally invasive, potentially harmful, and potentially detrimental uh, to the county in, in finding high quality employees, maybe impacting our private sector employees as well. Um, 
in light of the Dobbs decision last year um, and and moving forward, we've all felt a great deal of, of uncertainty and uh, worry in that arena. Um, as Council Member Albanas noted, that this information may be weaponized. And specifically, since we know that Maryland can be a place and space for those um, who, where their reproductive rights will be protected, once that information is collected by an employer, it is then available. And should they move somewhere else later, or should the landscape change, if it is not necessary to their employment, it should not be required for them to disclose. Um, I want to give thanks to our county human resources team in implementing the form they did in response to our legislation earlier this year. Um, and I know that I've been talking with our business community leaders, not just in our chambers, um, also in our nonprofit sector. And time and time again, the question that they say when I explain this is they go, there are people who ask those things? And the answer is, yeah, they do. They shouldn't, but they do. And um, I do think that the majority of our employers are doing the right thing, uh, specifically based on the responses that they've been given, which is that they're shocked that anybody would go down this, this pathway. But we need to take steps to ensure that folks don't, because it is very important. So thank you again, Council Member Albernaz, and I look forward to working with everyone here on the council to make the standard that we've successfully applied for our county government employees standardized throughout the county for all of Montgomery County's workers. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Wellens, for your work. Thank you. Councilmember Stewart. I'd like to co-sponsor, please. I didn't meet the deadline, so <laughs> I'd like to be noted. Thank you. As noted, Councilmember Jawando. Yes, I'd like to co-sponsor as well. Thank you. As noted. Uh, Ms. Wellens, anything else to add from your perspective? Uh, just to note that uh, Councilmember Katz's staff informed me that he, too, is a co-sponsor. Very Thank good. You. Council Member Kant is co-sponsoring. Uh, and with that, uh, a public hearing is scheduled for January 16th at 1.30 in the afternoon, and this bill is introduced. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, we now have one final bill, uh, one bill for final reading today, also one final bill, uh, and that is expedited bill 3727 contracts and procurement minority owned businesses sunset date amendments a geo committee recommends enactment i'll turn it over to the chair of the geo committee thank you um as stated this is expedited bill 37-23 contracts and procurement minority owned businesses sunset date amendments this extends the sunset date for the county's minority owned business purchasing program council members Jawando and sales are the lead sponsors of the bill and all council members are co-sponsors um, under article uh, 14 of the county code purchases from minority owned businesses provides uh, um, procurement procedures to address disparities in the awarding of co county contracts and the impact on minority owned businesses this article is scheduled to sunset on December 31st, 2023. In the meantime, the county has engaged a consultant to conduct a disparity study to assess this program and the county's contracting practices relative to minority owned businesses. Um, so the, what this bill does is it seeks to extend the sunset date of article um, 14 by one year to December 31st, 2024 to prevent the program from expiring while waiting for the completion of the disparity study. The Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee reviewed this and recommends enactment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank my colleague, Councilmember Sales, and all council members for co-sponsoring uh, the GEO Committee, Chair Stewart, and her committee for passing this. Uh, you know, our last conversation, uh, very top of mind, you know, we're stronger as a county when we support every member of our community and our small business owners, our women, minority owned business owners uh, need our support. Uh, we know that's a tough climate uh, in general, nationally, and this is a step that we can take given the uh, where we are and in light of some recent Supreme Court decisions, maybe some to come to make sure that we have the information to show why this is necessary in Montgomery County. So appreciate the county executive for moving forward. Uh, this has been a, a, an ongoing uh, you know, kind of delay, but we're glad we're moving forward uh, with actually getting this disparity study in place uh, so that we can continue to support all of our businesses, which are the lifeblood of our county. Um, so 
I appreciate the support and thank you for uh, all the colleagues uh, co-sponsoring. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Sales. Thank you, uh, President Glass, and I too would like to thank my uh, colleague, uh, Councilmember Jawando, for co-sponsoring this uh, bill, um, and to my colleagues as well, especially with the amendments that um, were uh, submitted with the bill. Um, as I stated, when this bill was first introduced, the disparity study is a necessary initiative to know the impacts of our minority, female, and disabled-owned businesses, assess our current efforts, and develop priorities to ensure we're operating in an environment that values and supports our diverse businesses. Uh, while Director Shetty recently shared during a GO committee session that they spent a record amount of funding at $246 million on the MFD business program in FY23, or 22.6% of total procurement dollars. I believe we are still far off from where we need to be to support our MFD businesses. 45% of Montgomery County businesses are minority owned, and minority owned businesses employ over 50,000 residents. Furthermore, four out of 10 most culturally diverse U.S. cities are in Montgomery County. With these numbers and our county's majority of people of color only expanding, we should see much greater success rates for our MFD businesses. In my role on the Economic Development Committee, I have been working very closely with MFD businesses and programs like the AMBER program. In Montgomery County, Black Collective Initiative that assists our businesses, that assists our um, MFD businesses and entrepreneurs by becoming more sustainable. Um, regarding the disparity study, um, my office has contacted the county's attorney's, uh, state's attorney's office to um, ensure we uh, remain on schedule to receive results as soon as they're made available. Um, again, I would like to emphasize our urgency for receiving this study. It has been far too long since we last received a study in 2014. I look forward to reviewing the results and putting forth concrete solutions to support our MFD businesses, which have been left behind for far too long. Again, I thank you um, to my colleagues and um, our county executive and his staff as well to uh, move this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wallens, any additional comments? Nothing to add. Thank you, Mr. President. Very good. Well, thank you, colleagues, and thank you to the GEO Committee for this. And uh, this is a roll call vote. So, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Ludke? Yes. Councilmember Ludke votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friedson? Yes. Councilmember Friedson votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous by all those present. Thank you. Uh, there is one more item on our agenda this morning. That is the consent calendar. Can I have a motion? So moved. moved by Councilmember Albernaz. Second. Seconded by Councilmember Sales. All those in favor of the consent calendar? And that is unanimous. Thank you, colleagues, and we are now in recess till 1.30. Have a good lunch. <laughs>